Hi there, how you doing? This is Don Mino, and uh, we're back again. We're going to talk about a TV show, which is probably a little strange to be on a, a radio program, but a program that I'm referring to is Hogan's Heroes. Now, that's been on for many, many years. It's in reruns, very, very popular. Many people don't know that Bob Crane is actually a Connecticut native. He's born up in the Bristol area, served for a time in the military. He got involved as being a musician. He's considered a pretty decent drummer. I did a couple of symphony orchestras and also a couple of dance bands. But he wanted to do radio. He worked at a couple of stations, as we've all done, as we were trying to work our way up. And he ended up in Bridgeport in 1949. Now, he was there until 1956 when he moved to California, but we'll cover that later. I've always considered on my unofficial list of the greatest radio personalities in different times of day, I've always considered him to be the finest morning man I ever heard, and I've never varied from the 1950s right through today. I still think it. And one of the reasons, not only was he funny, we didn't have to worry about any blue material in those days, uh, the censorships and so forth. He just didn't use it on the air. We didn't have to worry about double entendres or anything like that, or uh, what did we think he said, or any suggestive things. And most morning shows were done with one person, and of course that was Bob. The reason I think he should get some extra credit is because of the equipment that he had to use. Now, it was state-of-the-art equipment, but state-of-the-art in 1951 is a little different than now. We had what they called transcriptions. He would borrow little funny bits from different TV shows. I know I listened to Jack Benny and a few of the other shows where he'll take a funny line, but that was a lot of work because these were from records and you had to cut them into another record and then put them onto a third one. So it just got, he used to spend five or six hours every afternoon putting it together. And I would say with today's technology, it'll probably get done in a half an hour, three quarters of an hour, because you can push up the sound effects that you want. But uh, Bob did well. We all loved him. Everybody I knew listened to him in the morning, of course. On snowy days, you'd have to read cancellations. This is where we have similar backgrounds. Anybody that's been around as long as I have, we'd have to read 200 school cancellations in the morning, read it two or three times an hour, and that was, well, it wasn't funny, but it was, uh, it was a little bit of work. Then lost pet announcements. Try calling up your favorite station these days and uh, asking if you can... Uh, identify your lost pet but uh, we had to do it in those days and it was a lot of fun but the equipment as I, as I just mentioned with Bob we had 16 inch turntables and of course you can't uh, just push a button and have them start and then the microphones and the speakers and uh, it always seemed that we'd have a squeaky chair somewhere and Bob was very successful and sponsors wanted to get on his show because he was funny. He would kid the sponsors a little bit, but uh, that was one of the things. Now, of course, he got more and more popular, and uh, eventually the CBS officials from Los Angeles, I think they were visiting New York, and they heard about him from there, because if you if you're do a good job, they usually hear about you. That uh, They af gave him a good offer, and he moved to Los Angeles in 1956, and of course did some TV work, Donna Reed show, and then Hogan's Heroes came up and uh, he did that. But one of the things that uh, Bob did quite often was little snippets or sound effects. He would take a, a transcription of, a, say, a Jack Benny program or Fred Allen or someone, and he would see maybe there was a funny line that said maybe Jack Benny was standing there and uh, he opened the door and maybe there was a flower salesman or something there and Jack would react to it, but the flower salesman might say something funny. Then what uh, Bob would do, they, these transcriptions came to the stations and that was part of the network deal. And what he would do is they would, he would cut out that little piece of Jack opened the door and the salesman said, are you Jack Benny or are you uh, in this, uh, this person or that person? And it was always a funny line, but you'd have to physically re-record it onto another disc. And then there's nothing like disc recording to make you glad they don't have disc recording anymore because you smell plastic and it just makes a mess. But it's, it is exciting and it's with a capital X. So Bob would, or would borrow some of these things, and it really made a, a difference, but it was a lot of work. And that means you have to put your hand behind and, and have, uh, be able to jump in with the uh, sound effect when you needed it. 
And what they used to do on Sunday, by that time uh, the UICC moved up to Booth Hill and Trumbull, and they used to take six of their uh, fist disc jockeys, the guys were on during the week, Bob Crane, and there was a fellow that played jazz and another fellow that played big band stuff. Well, Bob's uh, idea was playing the new releases, the brand new records that came in. This is 1952, 53. And what he did was he would play the record, uh, and that was all he played. And his show was on from 3 to 3.30 on Sundays. We, used to, we rarely missed it. But Bob would play a record, and uh, he'd have to have someone to rate the record, so a chicken did it. Now, that sounds a little funny. What's this guy talking about? Is it chicken in the studio? Well, it's not only messy, but uh, it wasn't a real chicken. But Bob would play a record. Let's say I'll make up something. Uh, this is John, Johnny Jones with... Uh, I wish you orange aid or something. And he would play the record and he would say, Chicken, now what do you rate that? Now the way it was set up was a one egg rating was excellent. And the song was destined to be a hit. This, of course, in, in Bob's mind, he was doing all the work. Two egg rating, it was pretty good, but not, not as good as the regular one. And three or more uh, were really, really something. So he would play the record and he'd say, Chicken, what is the record? And if it was just a one egg rating, it would you'd hear the little I can't do a chicken balk balk sound effect, but that's what it was. That was again off a record and a separate cut. And then the one uh, one egg rating, you'd hear the thing clank down into a little cup. So you'd have a balk and then a cluck. And then if it was a two egg record, you'd have the two eggs, but they what you'd have is a giant the voice of a giant in between it. So you'd have let's say, bok, 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 and you hear the egg flop, and then the giant would jump in and say, another, in a big, deep voice, sort of a jolly green giant type of voice, and then the second egg would come up. Three, you'd get two, but some of the records, and it probably at least a couple of them a month, they were an in, in, in uh, unbelievable amount of eggs. They had some that went back about 25 times when the record was really bad in his mind, so you'd have the, the giant jumping in there, and then they'd start speeding it up, and that got a little, got a little crazy. But it was it was fine entertainment, and the chicken would go on vacation for two weeks every year. And he had a fella, and I cannot recall the drummer's name. It wasn't a real drummer. Bob was doing the work himself. It was that uh, the drummer would take in, and he would rate the records, and he would have a drum roll with a hit, hitting a cymbal for a one egg and so forth. So it was just a uh, unique type stuff. But uh, we didn't realize, I remember when, one Sunday we went up and we wanted to see the chicken. We did, this is before, this is when I was a little kid, and we didn't realize that it was recorded. And we went up and the fellow was very, very nice, the fellow that was on duty there, and we saw a tape recording, and that's the show was on tape. We didn't even know that. That was one of the first reel-to-reel -reel tapes I ever saw. But this was entertainment, and uh, it wasn't a lot of unusual things because... Most stations had little 15-minute blocks of things or maybe half-hour shows, musical shows. Someone would be singing or someone would be reciting. And it was just an awful lot of fun, but it was funny humor. You know, I had a chance when I worked in Hartford. We did the cerebral palsy at telethon, the station I was with, and then Bob was in there as kind of a special guest. Didn't get a lot of time to spend with him, but I did get some time and I mentioned the Bridgeport days and that had been many many years since then and Bob he looked at me very very seriously and he said you know I forgot how much fun those days were they didn't make a lot of money you don't when you start in radio but he said it was just unbelievable and I I thanked him for the entertainment that he provided because it just took a lot of skill because to try and do the sound effects he did and have to do everything manual. It's a little like saying something, then having to run downstairs to get the answer, and then run back upstairs again. It just takes an awful lot of time. But my first appearance in radio was with Bob Crane. I had uh, received vocal uh, training from a teacher and uh, breath control and diction and so forth. And since the studios for WICC were in the Stratfield Hotel in Bridgeport, we invited our class to the broadcast one Saturday, a special broadcast uh, with awards and so forth for having like the best, I think it was the best dental checkups, something like that. But the teacher had arranged it already with Bob and I was seated in the front and she asked me 
or he asked Judge Bob, and Bob asked me, are you going to stand up and tell us what this thing is all about? So without even being planned for, because of the training I had, he, he, me be interviewed by Bob Crane for about five minutes, and uh, it was just something to see, and uh, he was a young man, and he was only in his 20s then, but uh, you know, there's things like that you remember, and, and it wasn't unusual because radio would have awards or they'd have groups on, or the Lost Pets, like I mentioned, or certainly weather. We didn't have traffic reports. Uh, for some reason, maybe there was no traffic then. We don't know. But it's it, I've always thought of that show, and it uh, it's just considering what he had to use for the equipment to make the sound, it was just one of the greatest things in the world. And I watch Hogan's Heroes, and uh, I've just been grateful for the experience. This is Don Mino, and this shows you the kind of fun you can have on radio. And uh, we'll, as Rocky said to Bullwinkle, we'll see you next time.